geometry stuff. Then I'm going to switch and just have a few slides on uh, project sort of things um, and make sure I answer any questions there. And then we're going to spend most of the lecture talking about rasterization. And are we going in the back there? I don't have any video. Still don't have any video. Great. OK. Um, cool. So we got through most of geometry stage yesterday. Uh, I just wanted to talk about, uh, there'll be three quick things that I talk about here. Uh, and the first one's going to be vertex caches. Uh, so this is actually a really well-written paper. Hughes is a very well-known researcher at Microsoft Research. Um, what his goal was, he said, you know, uh, we're doing, uh, we have a big mesh, and the mesh is made up of all these strips and so on. And so it turns out that uh, most of the time, and I'm going to the board here for a second, okay, we're doing some sort of surface here. Okay, and we know that the uh, we know that going to meshes is good because it reduces our uh, overall number of uh, of trans or, sorry transformation and lighting kind of calculations. Right, we go basically from uh, from calculating this ver vertex's lighting information from six times to one time for this strip and one time for this strip. But what Hughes said is that is uh, that's too much. Because if we're doing this and then we're doing this, maybe we could have a little cache and we could store transformed and lit vertices in this cache, and then we don't have to do that again. Okay? And uh, I'm now going back to the board, or back to the screen, no longer on the board. Okay? So he's trying to reduce the transform and lighting cost. Uh, and so it turns out if you have a fairly uh, small cache, Okay, so you all, all you needed was, the theory was in 1999, 16 entries. Um, it might be some of you did this for a project because they actually do have these hashes in, uh, in hardware, um, is that you want to take this sort of thing and mesh the whole thing up so that it takes advantage of this cache. And so later work actually showed how to do this optimally where you can uh, divide it up into triangles and strips in such a way that it, um, it doesn't even matter how big the cache is. You'll use the cache to best advantage no matter what. So it's a cache oblivious algorithm, which is kind of cool. So what the pictures are we're looking at here is every, this is the, the stupid order, okay? Uh, and this is if you do the whole thing in a particular order and there's no cache. And then this picture is doing the same thing in a, a smart order and doing it with a cache. And so every place you see green is a cache hit. Every place you see red is a cache miss. And so the big thing is that this is redder than this. Right? So you have fewer cache misses when you use this particular technique, which is good. So it got down to uh, you know, the theoretical sort of best is 0 0.5 caches misses per triangle. Right? You know, back to the board. Um, that uh, every triangle in general um, will miss once every triangle if you're going in uh, just for one strip. So if you have perfect caching, then you should miss only half a time every triangle because you'll be using half your vertices from the previous strip. So 0.6 is really pretty good. So he showed how to do this, which was a good technique. Okay. Um, come on there. Okay, I got mouse. There we go. Uh, topic two, geometry compression. So one of the themes that I talked about is we're trying to reduce the amount of, uh, of, geometry, of, of bandwidth, right? Off-chip bandwidth is expensive. So maybe if we do a good job of compressing our geometry before we send it, that would make some sense. So um, we don't want to use something like gzip. I mean, we could use something like gzip, but uh, what we want to look at is the characteristics of geometry in general. So, well, we use these particular formats and so on. Um, can we do something that's domain-specific, a compression scheme that makes sense from the point of view of graphics, which is good. So also, we're willing to, uh, to consider lossy compression, okay, if it doesn't matter, and we'll see how. So the first thing he did was he did a generalized triangle mesh. Um, and this really is very much like a vertex uh, buffer today or a vertex buffer with index buffer capabilities. So um, although he was pretty much the first guy to show that this is a good idea from a compression point of view, okay, it's something we've already talked about. So that's no big deal. The things that were cool here, we're looking at how you, uh, how you start compressing components. So you might say, all right, 
position. Well, we're doing, uh, we're doing 32 bits per precision, x, y, and z. And what he said is, I think I can get away with 16 bits of precision. Okay, I'm going to send a half vector, or a half float instead of a full float. Okay? I, I think that's going to give us enough. Matrices, because it's very important you get the transformations done well, they're at full precision. Color. Okay, well, uh, you know, if we do a floating point per color, right, that's a lot of detail. I think we can get away with 12 bits, and that's probably the case. So, okay, we can compress that. Uh, this was kind of the cool one here, normal compression. Okay, so he said, all right, uh, we have three floating point numbers that tell us what our normal is. Okay, uh, that means we have 96 bits for the normal, and basically that means that we have precision to an enormously small angle. We have way more precision than we need. All the Hubble Space Telescope needs is 24 bits of precision to go anywhere in the, in the galaxy or universe, whereas here we're using 96 bits. Okay, so we don't need all those bits. Okay, cool. So we said, I think we can get away with 17 bits. That's going to give us 100,000 different normals that we can use. All right. And then he said, well, I can do these with like a lookup table, but uh, 100,000 is really bad. But if we take a sphere, there's all these symmetries on the sphere. So there's eight quadrants on the sphere, and all we do is change the signs. And within a quadrant, we're going to divide this into six pieces. And so um, it turns out all we have to do is like do one minus kind of calculations and so on. And so it turns out we can have a table that's only 2,000 entries that's this big. And then you just look up your value in there, and that's going to tell you what the 96-bit normal is. So all we specify is basically an index into this table, and we'll end up getting 17 bits of precision. Okay? And we can go all the way from 96 to 17 bits. So that made a lot of sense. It was kind of cool. So when he actually did these things, uh, here were sort of the pictures. So the right way to look at this is to say, all right, top left is ground truth, 96 bits for x, y, and z, 96 bits for n. And then as you start going across, you start seeing, okay, what happens when we start compressing this? Okay, so uh, if we look at this guy over here, this is 48 bits for x, y, and z, and 18 bits for the normal, like we described. And are there rendering artifacts here compared to there? Okay, they're pretty close. Do we see any artifacts? Like, this is the biggest one we have. So where are the artifacts here compared to the top left? It doesn't look as smooth along the tail. Okay. <laughs> and that might be a scanning artifact. Um, yeah, the shading looks pretty similar. It's kind of near the feet. Okay, kind of near the feet. Uh, is it a shading issue or a position issue? It seems like a shading issue. Like, the, the, it's not as bright. Okay. Okay, but it's not an enormous difference. Okay, so the pictures really do tell the story here. We can get a large amount of compression out of a geometry pipeline here um, and really not really suffer very much in performance. And here's two other models that they had and what sort of compression they got here. So um, this is not used in any hardware that I'm aware of today, which is unfortunate, but it's, uh, um, but, uh, it's still a pretty cool idea, so I wanted to make sure I brought that up to you. Okay, last thing I want to mention in geometry is uh, this is a particular ATI technology that we thought was pretty cool. Um, this really isn't supported in their newer hardware. Uh, this is something they did have in hardware for a while, but the issue here is, well, you know, we're going to do this sort of tessellation to lots of different, okay? We, uh, we have this big mesh of triangles, okay? And we don't want to send every single triangle. That's a lot of triangles. Instead, what we want to do is we want to send one big triangle and then have the graphics hardware turn it into a bunch of triangles. So uh, we're trying to reduce uh, geometry bandwidth. We're trying to send fewer triangles. So if we send one big one and use good rules to subdivide it down into something smaller, that's, uh, that's obviously a, a, a win for us. So um, in general, this generalizes to doing like higher order surfaces on the GPU, which is also you send in like a Bezier patch or send in a subdivision surface and you let the graphics hardware worry about tessellating it out. Um, so the way that they define doing this is they said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this triangle and we're going to be able to subdivide it using these rules, right? So we're going to take every edge in the triangle, put a new point there, and divide it into four triangles, okay? And then this shows sort of the level of subdivision that we're going to have. So if we go two levels deep, then there's two points per edge, and then that's going to make, uh, what, nine triangles. If we go three, we go three points per edge and so on. And then how do we actually interpolate this? So they had the particular rules that geometry would be interpolated uh, as a cubic. So uh, you would do cubic interpolation um, when you're going from here to here. 
uh, using the normals also. And then normals will be interpolated quadratically. So uh, it will take these normals here and then do quadratic interpolation across the mesh. So um, this sort of struck the balance between computational complexity and, uh, um, and uh, sort of what it actually looks like when it comes out. So it is not a theoretically perfect scheme. Like, uh, it is not continuous in the way that you would like it to be continuous. But uh, where it really helps is uh, silhouettes. So if you look at the left and you look at the right, um, particularly in terms of the silhouettes, it's just much, much better if you do this sort of technique. So silhouettes are a lot of things uh, you see. So you look at, like, say, the knee or these uh, sort of squarish parts. They get a lot better over there. So um, it's a good question why this didn't really take off. It might be because it was ATI only. But uh, anyway, this ended up being a pretty cool thing. Like, it's very simple subdivision rules. That's all I got for geometry. Anybody have any questions on geometry? Isn't this very similar to what the geometry shader tries to do? So this is clearly earlier than the geometry shader. You could, so the geometry shader is the stage that's going to go uh, after triangle assembly before rasterization. And what it's going to do is it takes a triangle in and it will put out anywhere from zero to four triangles. So you could use it to implement at least one level here. And you could feed it back again and again if you wanted to do more levels. So uh, what Trueform is, is something that would do it in fixed function hardware in 2002 or so. Today, you could, you could implement this in the geometry shader if you chose to do that. It was similar, whether it was a recursive kind of function. OK. How did so, they implement it? Did they divide it along the edge? just how many sublevels you have and then calculate everything? Yeah, so you'd say you know, Trueform up to five. Um, you know, this was sort of a driver call. You would uh, an open jail kind of call. You'd set it to five, and then every triangle you sent in, the hardware would go out and do this. So there's a little unit in front of the geometry stage of the pipeline where it would take one triangle, turn into a bunch of triangles, and then send those all through. Are you going to talk about um, frame buffer compression at a high level? But we're going to do that when we get the composition display in like three weeks. Okay. Or offline, if you really want to know about it. Yes, we're going to get there. So frame buffer and depth buffer are things that you also want to compress. OK. So I want to talk a little bit about project stuff, since now's the time you should start thinking about it, now that none of you got any sleep recently. Um, let's see. What do we want here? So I'll post these also. So these are just some thoughts. Um, first, the deadlines. So you're going to look at this, and you're saying, oh, all these deadlines and stuff. The reason, so when I started teaching this class, it was like, just do a project. Do your own project. Great. And uh, what I found is uh, the projects benefit from uh, you guys getting feedback from me as far as what you're going to do. So these are sort of the stages that I've set up. Next Tuesday, I'd like you to think about a pre-proposal. Um, I guess I could say this is optional, but I encourage you to use it. And what I want is just take a couple paragraphs and summarize what you're thinking about doing to me in an email. Okay, sort of talk about what you think the hard problems are. You know, what do you actually want to solve? And what I'm going to do is give you some quick feedback on that and say, that's a great idea. You should do exactly that. Or, okay, well, it seems to me the hard problem is X, and I really want you thinking about that in particular. Or, um, oh, somebody's already done that before. Here's what they've done before. Or, here's a couple references you really should read before you do your main proposal. Okay, I just want to give you feedback based on my experience. I'm very open to lots of different kinds of proposals, but I'm happy to give you feedback. And I'd like you to get me that by next Tuesday if you're interested. You can send me two or three project ideas and say, OK, well, I'm going to give you one fat paragraph on each of these. Uh, which one do you think is the most interesting? And I'll be able to give you some feedback on that. Okay? If you don't have any idea what you're doing, you can use this as an opportunity to ask some questions. But it would be really nice by that date if you at least had an idea of a direction that you wanted to go. I thought the coolest thing you talked about in class was this. I'd like to do a project along those lines. Okay? So this is useful for you. Tuesday, I'd like you to do a formal proposal. And we'll talk about that in a second. So what is a formal proposal? We'll talk about that in a second. But you actually have to turn in the formal proposal. And that's sort of your contract. You're going to say, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, some of you are going to have proposals, hopefully none of you, that maybe uh, have some holes in them, like you didn't give any references and you really need to do a couple of references because I need you to distinguish your work from them. Or like your scope is way too small, or more realistically, your scope is way too big. And I will ask you for a revision there. Um, and again, the goal here is to make sure that you are biting off something that is chewable. 
Um, and then finally, on the 12th of March, you'll be doing a write-up. So that's something you'll also turn into SmartSite. Okay, so what do I want? I want you to actually do something. Okay, <laughs> so that's the number one thing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I want you to come up here at the end when you give a presentation and say, this is what I did, okay? I did this project. I don't want to report on things that people have done before. I want you to actually do something, okay? Run some experiments, write some code, and so on, all right? Uh, where there is, a, a, you know, you've produced some sort of tangible thing when you're done. In general, I usually recommend you do a, a small thing rather than a big thing. Usually people say they're going to do too much, and then uh, the problem, and then I try to get you to cut that down to something that's reasonable, but when you promise too much and you can't do it, your project ends up being kind of spotty. And I'd rather you say, you know what, I'm going to take this small, narrow problem, and I'm going to do a great job on that. And that's usually a better seed for things going forward than one thing that's done fairly spottily. I will give you feedback on that, but if I think it's too big, I will tell you that. Okay? But... Uh, in general, you should get better as grad school goes on about being able to have a good idea of how much work it's going to take to do something and how long it's going to take you. So that's something you should have by the time you graduate. Like, okay, uh, I can do this project. It's going to take me this many hours, and this is what it's going to be when it's done. Uh, here's some thoughts on proposals in general. Okay, These are things you shouldn't be doing. Okay, I really want you to think about your problem now. So the number one way things fail is when people give me this really wishy-washy kind of proposal that doesn't have a lot of specifics, and then three days before the projects that do, they come and they say, yeah, I'm not really sure what I'm doing here. It's very frustrating for me, because this is not the sort of thing you want to be doing in three days. So I want you to really think about the problem now. Okay? That's why I'm making you do all these steps here. Um, Try to do some literature searches, and you should get good at this too. I'll be able to give you some feedback in that, and you can ask me for references in particular areas that you should look at, but you also need to acquire the skill of being able to find things on your own if you need to. So you shouldn't rely on me to tell me all the sites. You should go out and try to do a search and say, I think the two most relevant papers are this one and this one, and I'll be happy to give feedback there, but you need to learn as graduate students to do literature searches. I'm really happy to take suggestions from you, and I really want you to put down a schedule of work. Okay? And this is so that you know if you're on track, not so much if I know I'm on track, just uh, you'll know you're on track if you can set up this schedule of work. And then you can plan around other stuff. If you have this big deadline at the end of February, well, you're not doing any project stuff that week. That's fine. Just make sure you put work in other places in the quarter. And when you actually write the proposal, uh, I want you, basically it's a promise. It's saying, this is what I want you to grade me on. Okay? You get to draw the lines on the playing field and tell me what game we're playing. This is, this is the project that I'm actually going to do. So here's some of the things that you should think about. Okay? What are you solving? Motivation, why that problem is important. I want you to be able to cite the relevant work that's out there. I want you, in the proposal, at least to have an initial approach. Okay? To say, you know, I want to solve this problem, and here's what I think is a legitimate way to move forward to doing it. Okay, it might not be what you end up doing, but I want, you to, I want you to have something plausible there, that you put enough thought into the problem to know that. And then I think from your point of view and mine, it's good to have weekly milestones. I'm not going to be checking with you, but it's helpful to be able to do this. The whole proposal should be two or three pages. Okay, it shouldn't be very big. Maybe have pictures. The goal is not to write a book there, okay, but the goal is to cover these things. Okay. Uh, when you're all done, the, there will be a talk in the last day. So the last day of class is basically all you guys giving five-minute talks each, and you should have your proposal done there. The other thing I'll say is there are people who, for whatever reason, whether you have papers or whatever, who have not finished uh, the assignment to, and most of you have talked to me about this, and that's cool and understandable, um, and I'm willing to work with that, but you should not let this... Uh, don't let these slip. It is more important you do these than it is to get the project in. So prioritize these in whatever you're doing. And talk to me about your time frame if you've had project issues, or sorry, homework issues. Okay, uh, and then I just sort of wrote down some of the stuff. No, that isn't the one. Uh, nope, all right, now we're gonna go. I have one slide that's sort of, um, okay, all right. Sorry, one more slide on uh, project proposals here. Okay. Uh, this is uh, another slide from a different year <laughs> about uh, what I want to see in a proposal. So 
I would say it's all the same points I just said. If there's anything new there, I've expressed it in entirely different words. Okay. Um, some of the architecture questions that have come up uh, in this class just a little bit. Um, some of you did your, uh, your homework assignment with unified shaders. If you have a GAD class processor or better, some of you did it with split shaders. Okay. We sort of talked about different pros and cons of unified versus split. Okay. Can we quantify that? Can we turn that into a project? Which one's better and why? Okay. Uh, looking at fixed function units, like the rasterizer, how do we implement those in a programmable pipeline? Okay, the pipeline's getting more and more programmable. How do we start doing stages that are currently fixed function in something programmable? What are the right algorithms to do there? Um, something ambitious is building the whole pipeline in a programmable framework. Okay, that is a difficult but a very cool problem to think about. Uh, in general, we've talked about data parallelism in this class. Okay, thread parallelism. Right, that's a different way to do it. Something like Larabee will end up offering both kinds of parallelism. Okay, what's better from a hardware point of view? Okay, that's a very big and broad question, but you might find an aspect that's interesting there. Okay, issues with uh, CPU kind of state sort of thing. Okay, how is state managed? Well, um, CPU does latency limited stuff. GPU has lots of threads to do sort of the latency hiding kinds of things. All right, for general sort of problems, what's interesting there? Uh, texture cache. So pretty much all the texture cache work, and we'll talk about this in uh, a week or so when we get to texturing in this class, but all the behavior ends up being a single texture. And now any interesting scene has many textures that you're applying on every fragment. And so all the work that was done academically on texture cache stuff is all totally uh, single texture stuff. So you could do something that is, you know, the last thing that was published on texture caches was like 10 years ago. So none of it's recent, and it's all been done in the industry, but nobody knows about it. So it would be kind of cool to look at that from a, um, from a, a project point of view. Um, we'll also see a lot of people do GPU computing kinds of things. So one certain way is that a lot of people come from different kinds of application domains here, uh, and we get people that are in the crypto lab or networks or who do scientific computing, whatever. And so I see a lot of projects where people build things in CUDA on something where they're an expert. And that's always interesting because you're taking something you know and applying it to something you're learning about here. Uh, things in GPU computing that are unsolved, people haven't really done trees or graphs, priority queues is another one, and maybe you could build that out of a tree, but these are just data structures nobody's really done. Um, I'd love to see somebody do a project on compression that's suited for parallel hardware. So uh, gzip is something that's really, really linear, okay? But could you take uh, you know, a big input set and sort of cut it up into chunks and then decompress each chunk separately, or compress chunks separately? I'm happy to talk to other people if they're interested about this, but there's not really been any parallel-friendly compression work of which I'm aware, and that would be kind of cool for a, um, for a GPU sort of thing. Lots of application domains. We had a cryptography project last year that was kind of cool, doing search, although I did see a, uh, a paper on that last year that was kind of cool. A couple of people mentioned dynamic programming in this course. I don't know anything about it, but it would be pretty cool if somebody was interested in uh, implementing that. So these are just things that we've sort of talked about in class a little bit, um, so I wanted to bring them up as ideas. Anybody have any project type questions? Cool. Uh, I guess the final administrative announcement is that Justin Hensley is coming on uh, Thursday. Uh, Justin's actually a graduate of Davis as an undergraduate. Uh, he got his PhD at North Carolina. He's been working at uh, ATI for a couple of years. He does a lot of their GPU computing kind of work um, there. Uh, very bright guy, knows their hardware well. Uh, he's also interested in GPU language kinds of stuff, uh, so very happy to have him come out. Um, the important things are please come on time. Please be extra attentive and drink your rock star caffeinated beverage or whatever you want before he comes. Um, and you know, challenge him when he's here. Ask him tough questions. There's a lot of things that have come up where I've offered my view on things, but he's the guy that actually builds these things. And so the really interesting architectural kind of questions, he's the kind of guy. So uh, the other thing is the class will be fuller because I'll invite people from graphics and architecture and so on to see these talks. So um, besides getting here early because it's a polite thing to do, I'd advise you to come here just a little bit early to uh, make sure you get your favorite seat because it would be horrible if we came in and you, know, you guys always sit in the exact same seats. And what if somebody sat in your seats? That would be horrible. So try to avoid that. Um, very happy to have people. You know, we want a full room, though. You know, and we want him to feel like, coming to Davis is a great use of my time. There's great people there. They ask really good questions. They're really interested in what we do. So I very much encourage you to uh, be part of that. 
Okay, so basically I'm lecturing every Tuesday from here on out, and we've got a speaker every Thursday. Okay, so the rest of the day we're going to talk about rasterization. Um, so here's sort of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. I'm sure I'm only going to get to that or so. Um, lots of material to cover between here and there. Uh, so, okay, so here's the topics, and we're going to start with sort of what is rasterization, okay? So up to the geometry stage, we do all these geometry kinds of things. When we're done with the geometry stage, what we come out with is triangles in screen space, okay? We've got a bunch of triangles that are in sort of this 640 by 480 or 1280 by 1024 kind of space. Um, and so what is there about these triangles? So what we have is a triangle, which is a position at every vertex, again, in this uh, space, in the screen space. And then we have parameters at every vertex. So uh, we draw a big triangle over here. It might have a color here, a color here, and a color here. Okay? It might have four texture coordinates at each vertex. It might have an interpolated normal or a binormal or a tangent or all sorts of other things. You can put anything you want per vertex, and it's going to go ahead and interpolate it. You might have six colors at every vertex. Okay, then after rasterization, we get out fragments. And so fragments, uh, we need a couple things. One is which fragments are covered, which pixel locations, okay? And the second thing is uh, parameters per fragment. So when we have a triangle, it has red at one color, green at one color, blue at one color. What is it for the fragment in the middle? So it makes sense that we're gonna wanna sort of do some blending there to sort of blend the values. And it makes sense we'll want to blend them in a smart way that if you're very close to a vertex, then you'll mostly get that vertex's value and so on. And so we'll define this more concretely. But this process is called uh, uh, interpolation, where we have values at the corners of the vertices. What's the value that we get in the middle? Okay, That's interpolation. So there's sort of two things we want out of these vertices, and we're dividing rasterization into these two parts, and we'll talk about them separately. The first one is which pixels get co covered, and the second one is which colors do we color those pixels that are covered. Okay. So what's a fragment? A fragment is going to have a pixel location and then parameters that have to do with whatever we happen to pass in. Yes? So there's always one fragment per pixel on your screen. Is that true? Or are there more fragments than pixels? So, okay, so the, the analogy is I always say, uh, so, uh, okay. There's a lot of ways we can express this. The simple way is to say that for every pixel, we have one sampling location, okay? At that sampling location, we might produce multiple fragments, all right? That if I'm drawing here, I'm going to have one for each of my hands, one for your face, one for the desk behind you at any given fragment, okay? Now, all of those fragments must at some point resolve to a single pixel. It might be that I just take the fragment that's closest to me. Okay, if it's opaque, that makes sense. It might be that my hands are partially transparent and we're getting your nose also. All right? If we do that, then I'm somehow going to have to combine them, but I'm still going to end up with one pixel out. So uh, the big picture is at a pixel location, we might have many fragments, which will all end up resolving to a single pixel when we're done. We're not talking about that today. So uh, what I'm going to cover is, this is rasterization, the next lecture is on texturing, and then the lecture after that is on composition and display, and that's a process of composition. How do you take a bunch of fragments, put them together to make a single pixel? Cool? All right. So uh, what we're going to start looking at is this first part here, which is pixel coverage. So how do we know which pixels we cover? Okay, so some of these make sense. So the first thing we're going to look at is what we call triangle traversal. We have an input triangle, and we want to walk through it and figure out which pixels it covers. Okay? Uh, so it's really important that we be able to do that. How do we traverse this triangle? So the first thing is, well, what, if we do traverse the triangle, and we have a pixel, and we want to test it, how do we figure out how a pixel belongs to the triangle? Okay? So you would say, if we uh, express this pixel as a square, Bad analogy, pixels are not squares, and we'll talk about that later. But if we did it as a square, it's pretty clear that this pixel would belong to this triangle, and it's pretty clear that that one would not. Okay, so that's pretty cool. But then the question is, what happens, uh, you know, here? Do we count that pixel? Do we count that pixel? What about these? Okay, and it starts to get a little bit harder, right? Because we're going to have an intersection here. So the really important thing is what we call uh, a sampling point, all right? We have to sample 
uh, the triangle at certain points that are associated with the pixels. So these are sampling locations. So the easy thing that we can do, and we're going to start with this, is we're going to say that we sample in the center of the triangle. OK. I don't think that's the right word. I think what I actually secretly meant was that, which makes a lot more sense. Pixel. <laughs> so we have a pixel, and we're going we're gonna to approximate this pixel by saying it's just a point. Okay? It doesn't have spatial extent. We avoid these sort of problems. We sample in the middle of the pixel, okay, and we check if that point, zero-dimensional point, is in this triangle or not. Okay? But that's not perfect. Okay? Because what we really want to do is sort of take this area integral over the whole pixel location and use the filtering kernels and so on. Okay? We'll talk about that sort of thing later because this point is a horrible approximation of this area. Okay? But it's easy. And so we're going to start off looking at rasterization just as points. So when we look at these problems up here, we're going to say, well, is this, well, if we approximate it as a point, no. Okay? The, this pixel does not belong to this triangle. This one probably does. This one probably does not. Okay, we're just saying we're going to treat this uh, pixel as a point. So what that means is we're going to get a picture like this, and we're going to say these points belong to the triangle. So the picture that I have here is doing a sampling point at every intersection of two lines. Okay, and this makes sense here, right? Okay, pretty easy. So, all right, that's kind of cool. Uh, we can do that. Um, one thing we do want to note is that these points are floating point. Uh, it turns out we're often going to use fixed point math to, to recommend them. Um, what we don't want to be doing, so this is uh, sorry, uh, projected points in terms of the, uh, in terms of the triangle. So we're going to project the triangle onto the screen. Okay? And those are going to be floating point kind of vertices for the triangles. Maybe we can use fixed point math to represent them because that's going to cost us less power and it's very important in mobile. So what we don't want to do is take every triangle. Now I'm going to use the board again, sorry. Okay, we're going to have sort of our pixel grid here and we're going to have points here. Okay, what we don't want to do is say, all right, we've got a triangle here, here, and here, and then approximate that triangle by only rounding off to pixel centers, okay? That's a pretty bad approximation, okay? If we take every point and we round it to its closest pixel center. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have a bunch of points, what we call sub-pixel coordinates. I'm now done with the board. Um, and we will snap, uh, snap vertices to these points. And presumably, we're probably going to have a lot, you know, 8 by 8 or 16 by 16 or something. Um, and if we do it uh, well, then uh, we, we always snap to the closest sample. Um, it ends up allowing us to use fixed point coordinates for a lot of our rasterization stuff, which is lower power and a little bit easier to deal with than some of the floating point issues that you might have. So uh, not, uh, this is just sort of an aside. It's not so important for the rest of it. Now, we're going to go back here, and we're going to look here, and we're going to say, this makes sense to everybody. OK, bam, we're done. OK, but it gets a little more complicated. So here I'm drawing two triangles on the left here, all right, a red triangle and a blue triangle. And those triangles happen to land on the same scan line. And that scan line is a place where we're taking pixel coordinates, all right? So do we, who owns those green points? Okay, so we have choices. We could say neither one of these triangles owns them. The red triangle owns them, but the blue doesn't. The blue triangle owns them, but the red doesn't. Or both triangles own them. So the question is, what do these what do these points actually belong to? Okay, what do you guys think? What makes sense here? Okay, same question over here. We end up having triangles that share a vertex here. Okay, they all actually land right on the vertex. Who owns this point? Any of them? None of them? All of them? What's the right thing to do? Okay, 
So, uh, so let's keep in mind that when we put things through the graphics pipeline, these triangles are separate, right? The red triangle doesn't know anything about the blue triangle. They can't get together and say, okay, this is how we're going to work it out, okay? You want to draw this blue triangle totally separately. Now, uh, if you're saying you want to blend this guy with this guy, then that means that when we rasterize this, we're going to have to mark these points as somehow special. And that could make things difficult, right? We don't want special cases in our pipeline, okay? We'd like to be able to handle these in such a way where we don't have to mark them as special and do something special with them, okay? All right, so what are some, you know, I, I want more ideas here. This is a good discussion. What else can we do? Whoever gets their last gets to keep it. Okay, so we can say the last one. So the nobody gets to keep it until the last guy, okay? And again, we have this issue that all the triangles are processed in parallel. None of them know about each other. You don't want them having to communicate. That would be bad. Nothing? Yeah, did you raise your hand? Uh, no. No, you didn't. All right, cool. Stanley. Depth? Depth. Like, okay. the depth of the triangle, that's the depth test. That's where it's resolved over here, right? Uh, well, but we're not doing resolution to anything. We're generating fragments, okay? It might be that this triangle is in front of this triangle, in which case, later on in the pipeline, any intersections they have might be resolved, okay? But uh, um, right now, we just want to generate who owns these fragments, okay? We're only doing fragments at this point. Okay, both of them. Why? So use your mic. So one idea is both of them. All right. So why both of them? I, I think the thing is, if they're owning something, if I'm not sure what comes further down the pipeline. Okay. But if you want to kind of keep the characteristics of the pixel for each triangle. Okay. Each of them needs to own it. Okay. Um, and that's a, that's a sensible way to do it. Uh, it is not the correct way to do it. Okay. So I'll give that away yeah, right okay. now. No, no, but, but we'll, we'll talk about what the right way to do it. But, I mean, it's a, it's a legitimate thing to say, all right, it intersects both of them. We're going to make sure that both of them draw this. Okay? More ideas. Okay? What about that guy over there, far side? What do we do? That was an NVIDIA interview question, by the way. Like my thought process, but if everyone's done independently, then he doesn't know that the other guy exists. That's true. So, that's I a mean, good way to think about you it. And you can't say to have all of them share it, and you can't say none of them, but none of them create that 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 fragment. So the only thing you can do is is yeah. <laughs> you just talked yourself into a corner. <laughs> um, okay. Other thoughts? Okay, I mean, what are you actually recommending here? Okay, we gotta solve this problem, right? Is, is it possible to further break down the that pixel into smaller pixels? Or? Like a, a little pie piece of a pixel? <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, if you if you take a square and you break it into four squares, and now you do the test again. Okay. Um, well. Even if you did that, let's just, I mean, this really is at the tip, okay? So if it actually was a pie and it was a pixel of finite size, you'd kind of get a pie wedge. But in this case, we're approximating the pixel location as a point, and that's a, a good approximation to use, okay? There's no area there. I mean, there's no dividing it down. It's zero dimensions. It's just a point. So... This is happening during the rasterization stage. Yes. So that means you're generating fragments. Then wouldn't you, since none of the triangles know about each other, wouldn't you just generate four fragments and leave it up to another stage to figure out what happens? Okay. So this is one, um, it's actually the same thing we heard in the back there, to say everybody says that they border on that. They all, you know, have a piece of the pie here, so everybody's going to generate one. Okay? So um, for the same reason that, this is, that, that having both of them on it is incorrect, that is also incorrect. What about just making it non-deterministic and saying just whoever happens to end? Okay. You can guess, right? All right, well, it looks like I take up, uh, you know, half this fragment. I'm half the side. I, I'll generate, you know, 50% of the time I'll generate a fragment and 50% I don't. 
So um, statistically, that's a good idea. In practice, it's probably a very bad idea because it's going to make things flicker. If this guy really is red and this guy really is blue, you're watching this whole line of pickles, uh, pickles, <laughs> pixels going from red to blue and back again, and that's probably visually very distracting. Okay, so I showed you this picture like two ago, and you said, oh, this is an easy problem. Okay, it's not an easy problem. It's a tricky problem. Okay, so let me show why having more than one is a bad idea. Okay? Let's say uh, these guys were, uh, had transparency. Okay? So to fast forward to transparency, as you say, you have a couple fragments, and they're both at the same place, and they're both partially transparent. Basically, you're adding together the contributions. Okay, so uh, is that really the right way? Okay, so if nothing else is there, like if I have something that's blue and transparent, and if there's nothing else there, it's going to look full blue, right? Because it's the only thing there. It's just blue, All right? So if this guy's blue and this guy's blue, okay, then this guy's sort of full. This guy's, all right, that's the wrong way to think about it. All right, start over. Let's say this guy's like half intensity blue and this guy's half intensity blue, but a transparent half intensity blue. Okay? We have two pixels, that, two fragments that generate here. Okay? They're going to be composited together to make a full blue. Okay? So if you look at this guy, it looks like all these pixels are half blue, all these pixels are half blue, and these guys are deeper blue. Okay, over here it's even worse. You have quarter blue, quarter blue, quarter blue, quarter blue, and you have lots there. Okay, it means that if I cut this thing up here into six triangles, this gets even bluer. And that's not a good thing at all. Okay, what happens if neither one of these takes it? What's this going to look like when it's rendered? Yeah. Okay, big, you know, empty stripe there, right? And you don't want to see that either. Okay. The right answer is that you would like one of these guys to own it, but only one. Okay? Because then that's going to solve, you know, just like you want to generate one fragment here, you also want to generate one fragment here, and you want to generate one fragment here. Okay? This should render the same as if I had a triangle here and a triangle here, because it's the same square, right? You don't want any differences there. That make sense? All right? Uh, does it matter which one we pick? Let's say we said, okay, the red guy, he gets all these. Blue guy doesn't get any. Is that okay? Okay, what if we said the blue guy gets these? The red guy doesn't get any. Will that work? So either one of those works. And the question is, how do we actually make this work? Okay, over here, what we want is for one of these guys to own it, but only one. Okay? That if we draw this big rectangle, it's going to have one guy that owns it, the big rectangle. If we cut the rectangle in pieces, we still want only one guy to own it. Okay, so the rules that we're going to have to do this have to distinguish these facts. So the first one I'm going to show is rules for how we deal with this situation. What happens when you have a shared edge? Okay? And the rules we're going to have are what we call shadow edges. All right. So what we're going to have is, say, every edge is either in shadow or not in shadow. And so when we look here, we're going to say any edges that point to the right, okay, these edges point to the right, these edges point to the left, okay? We're going to say any edge that points to the right is in shadow. Any edge that doesn't point to the right or that points to the left is not in shadow, okay? If you are on a line and you are in shadow, you don't render. You don't generate a fragment. If you're on the line and you're not in shadow, you do generate a fragment. Okay, then you've got the issue of, well, what if it's a tie, okay? This edge isn't facing left or right because it's horizontal. So uh, then you break that tie by if it's facing up or down, okay? And that's gonna solve these problems, okay? In this particular case, if we use those shadow rules, then the blue triangle will draw these fragments and the red triangle will not. Because for the blue triangle, this is not in shadow. This line is not in shadow. For the red triangle, it is in shadow. Okay? But 
the red triangle would have to know the existence of the blue, the blue triangle, right? No, it doesn't. Break. It doesn't. Okay, you don't have to know anything about the blue triangle to tell which one of your edges are in shadow, right? That guy doesn't know. It doesn't know if there's something here or not. He just knows this edge is in shadow. Okay, if there's nobody else here and this is on a line here, there's just no fragments drawn there. That's fine. Okay. If there is somebody there, then the other guy will draw them. If there's not, then nobody will draw them. Wouldn't this really affect like how small fragments look though? Like if you're drawing a bunch of small fragments, like how it, you know, just its orientation will really affect how it's going. You know, okay. Like, you said draw small fragments. Well, I draw like, small. Huh? Okay. What do you actually well, mean? Like, you know, almost like a, a, Board. a couple of pixels big. You know, like very. Okay. Big. So we've got a bunch of points here. Okay, and you're saying, what if we draw things like this? You know, little tiny quads or something? Okay. Um, if it is a complete surface, like if it really is like a watertight mesh kind of thing, okay, every one of these guys is going to get covered by somebody. You might have some guys here that don't cover anybody. We throw them out. We don't do anything. But every one of these guys is going to get covered by somebody, okay, or else it's not a watertight mesh. Okay. If it turns out we don't draw this guy at all, well, that fragment doesn't get rendered. So it means that anything you render, the top right, I guess, face of it is always going to have missing fragments. Well, I mean, it, def fragment. it depends on what you mean by missing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what it means is that if I render this and this lands right on the line, then there will be no fragments rendered there. So, like, what if you have, I mean, like, even that shape, that, that, that square, the top and the right edges won't be rendered, so you'll just have an L, right? Well, no, I mean, well, let's say this is 100 pixels by 100 pixels, mm -hmm. okay? It means that it's actually going to appear that it's 99 by 99. But okay? the outside All of these black. get rendered. There's a one pixel outline that's black, and the rest of it's white. It won't be black, just it won't render. So it'll just be... Let's yeah. say we had a, let's say we had a complete red background and this was a blue square. Okay. It's not like there's going to be case, any yeah. black in well, that yeah, picture. Oh yeah, in that case it would work. Okay. If you were drawing just a black outline on, a, so you have a hundred by hundred pixel square with a one pixel outline. Well, this one pixel outline is, is. What do you mean by one pixel outline? Like the, just like you have drawn there, like you draw black like a, a, yeah. a four thick lines all the way around. Yeah. Okay. So will you can do that. The right and top wall, like the right and top black line not have its own um, fragment? Uh, it depends on how you draw a line. I mean, usually if you draw a line, you give it a finite thickness. You say this is like one pixel thick or something. And it'll make sure it's one pixel thick. I'm giving rules for polygons, not so much for lines. Okay. Sort of different rules for lines. Lines are not as important. Okay. I mean, usually if you're drawing you know, Master Chief playing Halo, there's no lines in that scene at all. It's all polygons. It's all filled. So on the same line, what about a texture that had a border? Well, all we're talking about here is rasterizing shapes, rasterizing 2D triangles or squares. Nothing to do with texture at all. If this generates a fragment and that fragment needs to be textured, it'll be textured. It just won't generate a fragment if it lands right on the scan line. Okay. The other thing I want to say is it's almost never going to land on a scan line. Almost all the time it's not going to land on a scan line. Okay. I mean, points are small. You have... You know, you have all, you know, many, many, many different sample points here, only some of which are on the line, okay? If you actually use floating point coordinates and you don't do the subpixel technique, it is statistically very improbable it's going to land on a line. But sometimes it does land on a line, and you have to do the right thing. Okay, so how do we do the one over there? How do we pick which one to do? Okay, it would be the green triangle on the left. Okay, and why do you say that? Because it is on the right, and it, yeah, facing right, it's in shadow. Yeah. Okay, so you want to draw the ones where it's not in shadow. Oh, okay, and then it's not. Okay, so under the shadow rules that I had here, this is probably the one that would want to draw it. And your rule would be if, it, if a sample point lands on a pixel, okay, Sorry, if a vertex lands right on a sample point, 
then you render that vertex only if both lines coming in are not in shadow. Okay? And you can demonstrate to yourself that that's actually going to work, no matter how, like, if I did, like, a pie around here with 360 slices, okay? Little tiny slices, and this is a great way to test a rasterizer if you ever build one. Render, like, uh, just a circle made out of 360 um, one, one, uh, one degree wide pie pieces, okay? Only one of those pie pieces should draw this guy, okay? And it'll be the one, in this case, that's right here, because that's going to be the only one where both of its lines are going to be not in shadow, okay? Now, let's say I was rendering this pie, and I had 360 pieces, and I rendered 359 of them, and I didn't render this one. Do I draw that or not? Sounds like you wouldn't. How come? That's correct. Because um, when you said that's the only one that is valid, so the rest of them are invalid. Right? So now I've drawn this whole pie, but I didn't draw the right one. Okay? The other way that I like to think about this problem is you can pick a direction, any direction. Okay? And let's say I pick the direction north. Okay? If a, a valid shadow rule is saying if the polygon that's, that cuts through north is there, then I draw this pixel. Otherwise, I don't. And that guarantees that only one of these pie pieces is going to draw the pixel. Okay, zero or one, depending if there's something there or not. So this was the NVIDIA interview question. What do I do about this? Um, okay, so the other thing to note is could I pick different shadow rules? All right, if we look here and I said... Facing to the right is out of shadow. Okay, would that work? If I have decided to change the sense of the shadow rules. Why well, wouldn't it work? I mean, as long as you're consistent, it should be As long as you're consistent. So any shadow rules would work. So one thing you could discover if you wanted to run some experiments is, what are NVIDIA's shadow rules? What are Intel's shadow rules? Okay, what are ATI's shadow rules? You can run an experiment and figure these things out. Okay, and they might have different shadow rules. I don't actually know what their shadow rules are, but you could do an experiment and find out. Okay, so all you gotta do is be consistent. That's the big picture here. Okay, so um, if you're doing these subpixel grid things, okay, and you have this problem of like one point, vertex on a point, then that's a tough thing to deal with. Okay, you have to worry about special rules for that particular point. So one thing you can do is if you use a subpixel grid, then you sort of shift the grid. So you make sure that a sampling point is never on the grid, and then you're never going to have this problem. So it's kind of a neat trick there. Okay, now, let's say I draw this guy. I draw a GL polygon. It's got five sides. All right, I draw these five sides like this, okay? What do I shade in? What's inside the polygon? Okay, is this inside the polygon? Is this inside the polygon? Do I do that pixel? Do I do that pixel? Are they gonna generate fragments there or not? So when um, the rasterizer does this, does it do a scan line so when it hits an edge and it fills it in until it hits another edge? That so it that's one way to build a, so <laughs> the big answer to this question is, uh, this is kind of hard, right? <laughs> like it's kind of hard to figure this out. You're suggesting that it really depends on sort of traversal order and traversal behavior, okay? And that's reasonable, and this is obviously a really tricky thing to figure out. Um, Almost certainly different uh, renders are going to render this differently, and they'll just pick some way to do it that makes sense. Okay? There's a lot of different ways you could think about doing this. So one way is to say everything within the, the whole of this should be colored in, and that would be legitimate. Okay? You could build a rasterizer in that way. Um, another way to do it is to say to use the Jordan Kerf theorem, which is a very cool theorem, which is what you do is you, is this inside the polygon? Okay? It turns out what you do is you take this and you draw a line in any direction you want. Okay? Any direction you want. If it's odd, it's inside. If it's even, it's outside. The number of lines that you cross. So here I've decided to draw a direction there, and I say, okay, it crosses one, two. This is outside. 
This is inside, 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 inside. The cool thing about the theorem is you can draw a line in any direction. Okay, if I start here and I draw it in this direction, it's always going to cross an even number of lines. So that's kind of cool. Um, so you could envision a rasterizer working in this way too. Okay, almost certainly different graphics hardware does different things. If you're dealing with these uh, non-convex kind of uh, uh, figures, it's pretty confusing. Okay, here's another one. I draw this guy. Okay, I go look at it and I say, well, this intersects three points. Okay, this this uh, there are three points that I think are inside this. Uh, this particular triangle here, okay? Are those the three points I draw? Is the right thing for me to do to, to generate three fragments in those places, even though they're not even connected? Okay, right? There's nothing generated here and nothing generated here. Is this the right thing to do? What would you do if you saw this triangle? Seems like when we rendered a screen, it wouldn't look like a triangle anymore. Okay. You're not casting judgment on if this is what I should do or not, but you're right. If I did it this way, it would be a weird looking triangle. Well, so say you assign the three pixels to this triangle, it would look like you know some jagged line. It would look like and three disconnected fragments. Right, you'd have a little fragment, little fragment, little fragment that are not connected to each other. Oh, I, oh, the, I, I missed the problem. So the problem is that there are three disconnected, specifically well, disconnected. I mean, if each one of these is a scan line on your screen. So yeah, is the scan line the line or the space? I mean, in, in this case, the line. Okay. Okay. Like there is a pixel generated at every place where two lines cross. And then how wide is the pixel then? Well, the pixel's probably this, right? Okay. Well, one thing you could do is just have three disconnected pixels and hope to anti-alias them in some application. Okay. So are you suggesting that we draw it like this, that we generate those three fragments? It's possible. Okay. Other thoughts? Okay. What do you do? You're a rasterizer. Which pixels do I cover? I'm putting this out here as an idea. I would generate these three pixels is what I'm saying. Am I doing the right thing or not? Well, you know, to keep things simple, we kind of want to be dumb about it anyway. And like the previous example with the shadow edges, you almost want to assume that there's going to be a, a mesh around that to okay. finish it off. So are you suggesting this is the right thing? I don't know if it's the right thing or not, but it probably is what should be done. <laughs> You're pretty hard to nail down. Well, it, se it seems really wrong, because the visual effect is going to be horrible. It's going to be weird if we do it no, this I way. I just can't think of a good way to fix it. That's why I can't okay. say that. <laughs> Were you going to say something? Uh, it's kind of hard to know without knowing the whole mesh, but I mean, if you... But you have to consider every triangle independently. You have yeah, to. Yeah, you have to consider it independently. Uh, so I would say draw it. In the way that I have up here. Well, can, can you take like um, just the equation for a line y equals ax plus b and then compare the uh, location of your pixel against that line? Yes, and we'll get there. Okay, but uh, you know that is a mechanism by which we can figure out if it's inside. Okay, I mean if you look at this picture, these three things are inside. Like everybody can agree these three points are inside, at least as crappily as I drew it. Um, the question is, is this the right thing to do? I've decided there's three points inside this triangle. Is it the right thing for me to do to draw these three points, to generate fragments here, even though they're not connected? I mean, it seems similar to the example you have. Okay. <laughs> so let's say I drew three triangles, right? And I covered this whole big region here, and one of these triangles happened to be really little in here. Okay. I better have drawn those three points and only those three points. Every other point gets covered by this guy and this, but we do want to draw those three points. It's going to make a really weird looking triangle. You can consider drawing a triangle that had a point up in the top right and a point at the bottom left, and that would still be the right thing to do. If it covers it, you have to draw it. 
even if it looks weird. And hopefully there's a mesh that's going to clean up after you and make it look good. And there's all sorts of weird anti-aliasing stuff, but in the base case, you have to draw what you cover. OK, so now that I've established sort of rules on, OK, we have to draw what we cover, and there's different things we need to do at the edges, OK, now we're going to look at actually how we figure that out. And what Will suggested was we can use edge equations. Okay, we can say, what we're going to do is we're going to define, we're going to have two points over here, and we're going to define this as an edge defined by those two points, and then we're going to define a side of that edge. Okay, inside, outside. Okay, this line, outside, inside, inside, outside. And we will say that a point is inside the triangle if it is inside all those three lines. Okay, that works. That is cool. That is a really nice way to be able to do things. And if we go back and we look at this crazy triangle here, then um, you know it's going to do the right thing. We're going to recognize those as three points. We don't care if they're connected or not connected. That's just what we're going to do. OK. We're inside. Great. All right? Uh, cool. Um, so we can do this with the line. OK, so that's kind of cool. Uh, we can define that in such a way that we say if this equation is greater than zero, basically what we're defining is a half plane. All right? And so if we say that uh, if, a, if a point is inside all three half planes, then it is inside the triangle. Okay? If this equation is equal to zero, what does that mean? Okay, it means we're on the line. So what do we have to do if we're on the line? Okay, then we've got to use our shadow rules. Okay, now the shadow rules basically are determined by the signs of A and B. Okay, for the right facing, left facing sort of thing, you can do all the math in your head. You can use this equation to tell which side of the shadow you're on. Okay, but the shadow rules are very easily determined by looking at these. Okay, you can build that into your rasterizer. Okay, so as we're calculating this, okay, so we use the shadow test if it's on. Okay. One of the nice things here is that when we use these linear equations here, okay, you might say, okay, we calculate this guy, we have to evaluate three different edge equations. And then we calculate this guy, and we have to do three different edge equations again. Well, it turns out we can simplify that process. Okay? This is sort of the basis of how rasterizers work. You can say, well, if I already know what the value is here okay, of each of these three line equations, then to get the value of what the line equations are here, I can just add A to what it was here. Okay? That if I use this and I know X plus Y, I can easily get L of X plus 1 comma Y. Okay? So it's an incremental calculation. I don't have to do all these multiplies and adds. I just have to do a single add if I'm moving from one pixel to its neighbor pixel. Okay? That's very handy. And I would really like to build a rasterizer that takes advantage of this, because the last thing I want to do is walk through this whole triangle and recalculate three line equations at every point. I'm lazy. I want to do as little work as possible. Well, it, it seems to me like maybe the opposite, like, because if you're doing it this way, then you can only do it sequentially, whereas if you were to actually recalculate, you can just make... You can do all of them at the same time, and okay. there'll be no. So uh, that's a great issue. Okay. The question is, uh, if we're doing all these things independently, then can we do more of these at the same time? So a modern rasterizer is sort of a mix of things you can do at the same time versus the sequential sort of thing. Okay. You obviously don't have enough hardware to do a screen size triangle all at the same time. Okay. Uh, if you're doing a whole bunch of stuff at the same time and you have little tiny triangles, you're wasting a lot of work. So they need to strike a balance. But you're absolutely right that we'd like a kind of scheme that we can do more than one pixel at the same time if we so choose. What uh, the technical term for this is the size of a pixel stamp. So you're stamping out a bunch of pixels at the same time. Okay? You, are you testing one at a time? Then your stamp is one by one. If you're testing a little two by two grid at a time, then your stamp is two by two. What is the size of a stamp? Okay? Pretty much NVIDIA and ATI use a stamp that's two by two. Okay? Intel is talking about in the next generation architecture using a stamp that's four by four. Okay? But the stamps are pretty small because triangles aren't very big and you don't want to waste a lot of work on little triangles. 
Okay, great question, though. Okay, here's another way that we can do it. So what we're seeing is edge equations will tell us if something is inside the triangle or not. Great. Okay, here's another way to do it. This is going to seem really crazy starting out. What we're going to do is we're going to define the areas of these triangles. Okay, the red triangle, the blue triangle, and the green triangle. All right? Then we're going to define B as the fraction of the overall area. All right? So B ranges from 0 to 1, basically. Uh, if B is large, if it's close to 1, it means that most of the paint is blue. All right? So if we're down at this place, okay, then the blue triangle would be really big, and B would be really big, because most of the paint in here would be blue. Okay, if we're over here, then red will be very big, and the B value associated with red will be very close to 1, because most of the paint is red. Now, we define it so that B0 plus B1 plus B2, the fraction of paint that goes to red, green, and blue should add up to 1. Okay, we define things in that way. Now, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to find area in the following way. And that's what's really important for this distinction here, that if the, tri if the point is inside the triangle here, on this side of the, this line, then the red value is positive. Okay? If this point is on the other side of the line, then the, the area is negative. So we're defining a negative area of a triangle, which seems really weird. Okay? It's the same sense, the same sign that you're going to get if you have a line there, okay, or edge equations. So the edge equations... The value is positive here and negative here. If we have this point and we make this triangle here, here the value is positive, here the value is negative. Okay? And it needs to be that way because if we take this and turn it over, then we're going to have a small red area, a negative red area, but the blue area and the green area are both going to be much bigger now. If we take a point way out here, we're going to have a lot of negative red area and a lot of positive green and blue area, and they all need to add up to one. Okay? We've defined things so that this always adds up to 1. B0 plus B1 plus B2 always adds up to 1. A0 plus A1 plus A2 always adds up to the area of the triangle. Whether or not we have a point in the triangle or out of the triangle. Okay, I want to make sure this is really clear because this is going to come up later a bunch. Okay? Everybody cool with this idea of negative area? Okay, we talked about negative area when we looked at what part of the class? Okay, what would we look at when negative area was important? Front and back faces. Pulling. Yeah. Pulling. It was a front or back face, right? We had negative area if it was facing away from us, positive area if it was facing toward us. Okay? It's exactly what we're doing right here. We're saying this is facing toward us. If it flips over, the winding direction goes in the other way, and it becomes a negative area triangle. I'm still a little confused about the, wind, the winding thing. Like, like if that red triangle was flipped this way, how would you... like? And, I guess there are, I just don't see how you know if it's going one way or the other way. Okay. That, that picture. Well, uh, usually what you want to do is uh, you will define a principal direction, and in this case we'll define the principal direction here. Okay. If I can get to the third point by doing that, then my area is positive. Okay. If this point was out here and I was at the principal direction, I have to go backwards to get to that point, and so I go this way and my area is negative. It goes into the board. Okay, so if I define all these triangles as principal direction for red, principal direction for blue, principal direction for green, those are all positive areas. If I take any of these points and move it out, one of those areas is going to become negative. Okay, so it's all a question of defining what you mean in terms of the vector directions, but it's easy to do that in such a way that this is always a positive area, and when you use your right-handed rule, it always has an area that points out of the board <coughs> positive. It seems that you need to calculate a lot more than Oh, we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, oh, it's a ton of work, and it's stupid because it's a crazy idea. Okay? It is a little bit more work. Okay? But if I can show you how to do this efficiently, and it turns out I use it for other cool stuff, okay, that this thing's awesome. This is great math. Okay? So this is called barycentric formulation. Um, and I'll, I'll, I hope I'll demonstrate to you by the end of probably next Tuesday how awesome this is because this is the way people actually build rasterizers. Okay, so it seems crazy, but it really does work. Okay, so now we have two sets of rules, both of which are going to give us the same result. We have edge equations, okay, we have this barycentric formulation, and they're going to tell us if a particular location is in a triangle or not. Okay, so the first thing we did is we figured out what are the rules for figuring out if it's inside a triangle. Okay, 
what's the math for telling if it's inside a triangle? And the next thing we have to do is we have to figure out how do we visit pixels to determine if they're inside the triangle or not? All right, so we can do some stupid stuff. Okay, one thing we can do is we can just take a bounding box around the whole triangle and visit every pixel location in that bounding box. Okay, so we draw the big blue box, we visit everything in the blue box, bam, we're done. Does that work? Okay, will I visit every green pixel here if I draw a bounding box? Yes. If it's implicit? Like it goes along the edge too, not... Sure. Okay. So yes, it, uh, it definitely needs to, to cover its edges. Okay. Why is this inefficient? The long polygon or a long triangle that a lot of unity area in a rectangle would be covered that you don't need to. Yeah. Think about going to the board. Screen. Triangle. Okay, that's kind of bad. You have this little sliver of a triangle, but you have to visit every single pixel that goes in here. Not so good. Okay, so in that sense, this bounding box traversal is very easy to implement. It's not the most efficient thing in the world. Okay, leaving the board. Um, how do we tell once we visit these pixels if it's inside or outside? Okay, how do we tell which pixels are green and which pixels aren't? Right? That's what we want, right? We want to figure out which pixels to turn on. How do we tell which ones are green and which ones aren't? Depends on how we traverse it. If we just go across one line, we can know when we enter the triangle. Well, if I'm visiting this pixel, how do I... So assuming that what I'm going to do is just go whoop, 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 all the way through the box, which is easy to program, right? For I equals bottom to top, for J equals left to right. Right? It's just a doubly nested loop. Once I visit a pixel location, a fragment location, how do I decide if I'm going to generate a fragment or not? Don't you just use one of the two approaches right. we talked about? That's why we have the edge equations or the barycentric formulation. Question on the, the barycentric thing, how do you know if it's on a line or not? Okay, uh, how do we know? One of the areas is zero? Yes, okay, if we have a zero area. Okay, if the red is a zero area, then we know that we're on this line here, right? Positive, negative. If it's there, it's right on. Okay, same thing as the line equation. So it ends up being similar math. But that means if you're at a corner, then two of them will be zero. Yep. So by that... And the you, other one will be one. And so you can actually f figure out how to interpolate this whole triangle with, with the barrier center coordinates. Well, I mean, if you're in here, then you're going to get a third, a third, a third, and you have to... Um, you know, the question is, is are, are those thirds the weights you need for barycentric coordinates? For, but I haven't even got to interpolation yet. All I'm worried about right now is, which pixels do I light up and which pixels don't I? We'll get there. Okay. All right. So we can use this bounding box traversal, but no, it's not very good. The classic algorithm for this is named uh, Crow's algorithm. It's after Frank Crow. He's a great guy. Uh, when I took this class when I was a graduate student, he taught this class. It was really cool. So here's what you do. You, this works on an arbitrary convex polygon. Okay, so nothing, uh, no, you know, it has to be concave is where you have sort of a notch cut out of it. That's bad. Okay, so what you do is you take, all, but it works on any polygon. So you take the whole polygon, you start with the lowest y coordinate. Okay, you figure out what the left and right edges are going here. And so then you start walking up, and every time you cross a scan line here, cross a horizontal line, then you spit out a span. You say, okay, I'm going to have a span that starts on this line, ends on this line, and I'm going to walk from here to there. And every time I cross a vertical line, every time I cross a pixel location, I'm going to say I have a polygon, or I'm going to say I generate a fragment. Then you reach the end here, then you walk up this line one more, okay? Every time you hit a corner, you have to change the equation you're walking. Okay, but you hit this corner and you say, all right, now I'm going to walk this equation. All right, there I intersect again. And then you spit out another span and you walk from here to there and so on. Okay, this is the classic way people built rasterizers. It's nice because basically the amount of work you do is proportional to the number of fragments you output. Okay, it's nice because walking is very efficient. You just go plus, 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 plus. And it also meshes very nicely with the stuff we'll cover later on on interpolation. 
Okay? So you keep going until basically you meet up again. Okay? So it's a nice, simple algorithm. If you're building a software rasterizer just in C, this is a really nice way to go. Okay? You get very efficient traversal being able to do this. Okay, one of the issues here is that pixels themselves, uh, like if you start doing complicated shapes, you have a bunch of regions. So here, in doing this, you're going to have one region with these two edges, one region with those two edges, and one region with those two edges. So you have to be able to switch. That's a little bit complicated. Okay, your hardware has to get a little bit more complicated that way. Uh, you could rasterize vertically if you wanted to. You could walk scan lines in the vertical direction. That works fine. Okay? You'd like to minimize that as much as you can. Right? You want to minimize the special cases. Okay? This is part of the reason that we use triangles. Triangles are simpler. All right? So one of the questions that always comes up is, why do we use triangles? Right? Why do we use triangles? Well, with a quadrilateral, we're going to have three different regions. With a triangle, you only have two different regions. Right? You can only change once. That makes it simpler. The real issue about using a quadrilateral is that it's not, uh, it's not definite what it's going to do. So we're going to do a little demo here. So I have this sort of quadrilateral here. It can be a quadrilateral that looks like this. So what I want you to do is I want you to hold these two corners here. Uh, how about those other two corners? Right, so we have the quadrilateral here, right? Now, we have sort of a saddle shape here, right? So all you know is one, two, three, four points. Okay, you don't know anything about the shape. But I can take this shape and I can sort of do that with it. It's the same points. Okay, same four points, different shape. That's bad, right? If we have a triangle, okay, three points make a plane. Okay, there's only one way to draw a triangle, flat. The pro thank you. The problem here is that no quadrilateral is actually flat due to floating point coordinates, which aren't perfect. Okay? No quadrilateral is flat, ever. Even worse, <laughs> you can always take a quadrilateral that's not flat and figure out how to make it concave. Always, no matter what. If it's not flat, you can turn in some bad direction and that bad direction is going to make it concave. That's hard to rasterize. Okay? You can't do Crow's uh, algorithm anymore. Okay? It just doesn't work. So now it's a concave uh, um, for some view. The real problem is when you end up with these bow tie kinds of things, right? If I have a quadrilateral that looks like this, you're looking at both the front and the back of this particular quadrilateral. That is a huge pain in the butt. Right? We haven't even looked at that. What happens when you look at the front of something or the back of something? How do your rasterization rules start working when you can see both the front and the back of a given quadrilateral? That is a big pain, too. So any modern graphics pipeline actually only renders triangles. Okay? All polygons are triangles. Whatever other polygon we get, the first thing we're going to do is turn into a bunch of triangles because we know how to rasterize triangles. We're not going to have any of these special cases here. Triangles are always convex. They're always planar. Okay? Easier rasterization and so on. So, triangles are great. We're sticking with triangles. Uh, I'm going to very, very briefly go through a few other traversals just uh, so we can get to the next thing. So, we can do better than just bounding box style traversal. Okay? Uh, one thing we can do is sort of backtrack traversal where you sort of go back, zip back here, and so on. And this is a fairly efficient thing to be able to do. Um, you can do like a zigzag traversal here where you go right and then left and then right and then left. Okay? These are all dependent very much on, uh, um, uh, these are all dependent on like what kind of triangles you get and so on. It would actually be kind of cool to look at different traversal algorithms. What is the most efficient way to traverse? And usually it's uh, the more brute force you have, the simpler control you have, but probably the more overwork you do. You can be really smart and do some things in a very clever sort of way, but then you have more complicated control algorithms. These are the sort of things that the people that build the rasterizers really have to worry about. Okay, so what I've covered today is, uh, is the part of pixel coverage, right? We have a triangle. Which pixels do we light up? And how do we visit those pixels in an efficient way? Okay. What we're going to do next Tuesday is we're going to talk about the next part, which is parameter interpolation. We have a bunch of pixels, okay? uh, and uh, what, do we, what colors do we make at them given the colors? How do we actually do the interpolation? Okay, see you guys on uh, Thursday. Drink your caffeine. Be alert.